Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining our e-seminar today, An Audiology Perspective of Computerized Dynamic Posturography and How It Fits into the Diagnostic Test Battery. My name is Teresa Boone, and I'm the Director of Global Education at Natus Medical, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Dr. Sue Doucette earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in audiology from Idaho State University in 1983 and 1985, and she earned her doctorate from A.T. Stills University at the Arizona School of Health Sciences, Sciences excuse me, in 2006. Dr. Doucette has worked as a staff audiologist at the Legacy Good Samaritan Hospital Audiology and Vestibular Lab since completing her internship in 1986. Her current position is that of Senior Audiologist and Vestibular Interpretation Specialist. Without further delay, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Doucette. Dr. Doucette, the presentation is yours. Great. You, <laughs> great. Thank you very much, Teresa. I'm looking forward to this and thank all of you for joining me. So what we're looking at is an audiologist's perspective of computerized dynamic posturography and how that fits into our diagnostic test battery. Now, I wanted to say up front that computerized dynamic posturography does not diagnose specific vestibular disorders, nor does it tell you specifically about the vestibulospinal pathways, although we are measuring reflexes with this. So I just wanted to get that out of the way and get on with the session. So the goals of this session is to give you a basic understanding of the diagnostic tests that we typically use to assess patients with dizziness and balance disorders, to be able to explain the role that computerized dynamic posturography plays in that assessment, and to help you effectively communicate the findings to facilitate any appropriate medical surgical treatment and to provide the information that's necessary to help the therapist provide the most individualized and successful rehabilitation program and falls prevention therapy. So the purpose of our diagnostic site of lesion testing is to try to determine what the cause of the dizziness is, because dizziness and imbalance cuts across every area of medicine. So I think of our diagnostics as a circuit board check. We want to know, is this a central vestibular problem, a vestibular vestibular problem, or a bit of both? Is it stroke or tumor? Is it heart, high blood pressure, an autoimmune disorder, thyroid problems, head injury? Um, it can be migraine, psychiatric. Just a whole host of pro uh, problems can come into play. So the first thing I want to get into here is the importance of diagnostic testing and the limitations of the standard bedside exam. There was an excellent, excellent uh, chapter written in the Shepard and Jacobson Balanced Function Assessment textbook. And chapter five by McCaslin, Dundas, and Jacobson did this very methodical review of the literature concerning most of the standard bedside tests of vestibular function. So they're looking at spontaneous nystagmus, the head impulse test, head shake evoked nystagmus, hyperventilation induced nystagmus, ocular tilt reaction or skew deviation, Valsalva induced nystagmus, Romberg, Facuta stepping test, pass pointing, and dynamic visual acuity. So let's see here. So they're looking at sensitivity versus specificity. So sensitivity is the percentage of subjects known to be abnormal that actually produce an abnormal test result. Specificity is the percentage of subjects known to be normal who actually produce a normal test result. And their conclusion after all of this is that although the tests reviewed in this chapter tend to exhibit a high degree of specificity, the attendant low sensitivity renders them relatively unsuitable for clinical use. In other words, bedside exams are useful, but alone they lack the sensitivity 
in that many abnormals may be missed unless they are very abnormal. So we run a series of tests to try to quantify the specific areas of deficit, if there are areas of deficit. So we look at audiometry, which is hearing testing, emittance testing, that's looking at the function of the middle ear, the eardrum, and the three little bones of the middle ear. We look at evoked potential testing, which includes electrocochleography, auditory brainstem response testing, and vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. We do rotary chair tests. We're looking at the vestibulo-ocular reflex, central velocity storage, visual and vestibular interactions, optic kinetics, subjective visual vertical testing. I'll be going through this later, so I'm just throwing the terms out there now. We look at VNG, video nystagmography, where we're looking at ocular motor movements, so eye movements, positionals, what happens to the eyes when they're in different positions, and the caloric test. We do VNG pressure testing, Valsalva and Tulio, where we might be looking for a condition such as paralymph fistula or superior canal dehiscence. Again, we'll go through this a little bit later. And then also computerized dynamic posturefy, which is not a diagnostic test per se, but it is a critical part of our test battery. So electrocochleography is where we're looking for Meniere's disease. And I'm going to grab my laser pointer here. Meniere's disease, and which is a form of endolymphatic hydrops, is when you have too much or fluctuating fluid pressure in the inner ear. So in this test, using different electrodes, we're measuring the amplitude of the summating potential the summating potential is a direct current, a DC potential that's created, an electrical charge that's created in the inner ear as the hair cells are converting the incoming sound into the electrical impulse that then is going to go up the auditory nerve, the brainstem, to let you know that you've heard something. So we're calculating a ratio. So we're looking at the amplitude of the summating potential versus the amplitude of the action potential. The action potential is the initial firing of the auditory nerve. So we want to know how large is the summating potential relative to the size of the action potential. That creates a ratio for us. And a ratio greater than 0.45 or 0.50, depending on who, who you read, is generally considered suggestive of excessive fluid pressure, endolymphatic high drops. So this is what a normal ECOG would look like, a normal ratio. This would be an abnormal ratio. You can see how much larger that summated potential is in this case as opposed to the normal. Auditory brainstem response testing is where we're measuring the impulse as it travels up the auditory nerve. And so we're looking for any evidence of mechanical pressure on the nerve, such as you might get with a benign tumor called an acoustic neuroma, also known as a vestibular schwannoma, or ischemia, which is compromised blood supply to the nerve, or a demyelinating disease, such as multiple sclerosis, that might be affecting the auditory nerve or brainstem. So this first here, is what a normal ABR would look like. So you have good definition of the waves. We're looking at waves one, two, three, four, which is usually hooked onto five, and five. These waveforms should each be about one millisecond apart. They should have good amplitude and good definition. Now this, so this is what a normal one looks like. This would be one that you might see in someone with an acoustic neuroma. Your wave one is normal, but then as you get out towards wave three, this is wave three, this is what it looks like when things are being disrupted. So the acoustic neuroma is putting mechanical pressure, maybe infiltrating the nerve, and it flattens out and reduces the, the morphology, we call it, the shape of the wave. Here's wave five, so this is wave five on the normal ear, 
This is where wave five is on the abnormal ear where there's mechanical pressure. So it flattens it out and pushes it out. It increases the latency or the time it takes for the impulse to travel up the nerve. Down here is a waveform that was similar to one that I got on an MS patient. So you have, again, a normal wave one, which is occurring before the myelin sheath kicks in on the nerve. But once the myelin that's, been, that's being destroyed by the MS starts, you just get a flat line. So this is what you might see in an MS patient if the MS is actually affecting the auditory nerve. Now, we also look at VEMP. We're doing cervical VEMPs in our clinic, and what cervical VEMP measures is the relaxation of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. That's the muscle that runs from behind the ear, down the neck, and then into the breastbone and collarbone. And we're putting a loud thumping sound into the ear, looking for that relaxation of the muscle that happens when we're putting little pressure waves. That loud thumping sound puts little pressure waves against the saccule, which is one of the gravity sensors in the ear that's connected to the inferior branch of the vestibular nerve. This is the only test we're doing that measures function of the inferior branch of the balanced nerve. The rotary chair and caloric testing look at the function of structures attached to the superior branch of the nerve. So we're looking at that reflex that runs down the inferior branch, coming down the bra brain stem to all of the postural control muscles. In this case, we're measuring the sternocleidomastoid muscle because it's easy to get to. An abnormally large VEMP, like you see down here, is what we might see in someone who has superior semicircular canal dehiscence, which is a mouthful, but to break it down, adhesion is to put together, dehis dehiscence is to be apart. So a dehiscence is an abnormal opening Think of it like cleft palate, an abnormal opening between the superior or vertical semicircular balance canal and the brain. There should be a plate of bone that separates those structures. Now, the, uh, the vestibular ocular reflex, okay, I see I'm not going to be able to, to uh, run my video clips here. That's okay. Let's shift again here. So in rotary chair testing, when you're turning your head to the right, your inner ear should instantly command your eyes to move in a compensatory movement to the left, equal and opposite to the speed of your head to prevent blurred vision, and then be quickly to the right in the direction that your head is turning. When you turn your head to the left, the inner ear should command your eyes to move to the right and then beat quickly to the left. This fast frame imaging gives your brain quick, clear snapshots of vision instead of the blurry images that you would see in a movie like when the camera pans a scene. So in rotary chair, what we want to know is to what degree the inner ear is actually telling your eyes the truth about how far and how fast you just went and in which direction you're moving. So that's the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Caloric testing, on the other hand, looks at vestibular function at super slow speed where the damage is most likely to happen first. Rotary chair tests the higher frequency vestibular function, which more approximates the speed that we're moving around at in real life. Rotary chair testing can also tell us a gazillion other things that are helpful about visual and vestibular interactions and the ability of the central velocity storage me mechanism to store the velocity that we've been traveling at in order to he help pre-plan the next eye movements. So we do single sinusoidal movements where the chair accelerates to 60 degrees per second and then slows and then reverses direction. And we do that at differing distances. So just like we test hearing at different frequencies, different pitches, we sense motion at different speeds. So we're checking at different speeds. 
the step test is looking at that time constant, and with that, we spin the chair up to 60 degrees per second and just keep it going at a steady 60 degrees per second. After a while, the fluids of the inner ear catch up with the speed of your head, so the little hair cells in there are no longer being deflected. Most people feel like they just come to a slow stop. Then we suddenly stop the chair, which sends those inner ear fluids sloshing back the opposite direction. So even though they're not moving, their inner ear is being fooled into thinking that they're turning their head. That produces a burst of nystagmus that we then measure again to see how well the ear is, is perceiving motion. And um, that again gives us a look at vestibular function, but that central velocity storage mechanism. Another test that I like in rotary chair is called the subjective visual vertical test. So what we're doing, we're asking the patient who's in total darkness, so they don't have the normal reference points, we're asking them to adjust a laser line to where they perceive it to be perfectly straight up and down, just like a flagpole. If you lose function in one of the gravity sensors, the utricle, it actually torques the eyes in the socket and will skew your perception of vertical pointing off toward the weak side. So when I saw a patient just two days after she had a vestibular neuritis totally take one ear out, she was spinning like crazy. She felt like she was walking on the wall practically, and her perception of vertical was 21 degrees off to the left, pointing toward the weak side. When I saw her then five days later, it had already improved because of the central adaptation process. It had already improved to only 14 degrees off, which is still a ton, but she was feeling much better because a lot of the central adaptation process had begun and a lot of her spontaneous nystagmus beating toward the good ear that she originally had had slowed way down. Then two weeks later, thanks to vestibular rehab and central adaptation, it had improved to only five degrees off to the next. So with video nystagmography, we're, it's sort of a battery of tests. We're looking at multiple things. We rely heavily on VNG test, testing video nystagmography. So just like with the rotary chair, we use infrared video goggles to very precisely record and analyze eye movements. The old way of testing was ENG, electronystagmography, where we actually had electrode patches placed around the, the eyes to record eye movements. There's a whole host of problems with ENG testing, but one of the biggest ones is that we would miss a lot of the torsional, the twisting eye movements that come with positional vertigo and also with some central problems. So with VNG, we're looking at the ocular motor function of the muscles and nerves and pathways through the brain that control certain types of eye movements. So we're looking at gaze stability. Are they able to hold their eyes steady on a fixed target? Different peripheral, meaning inner ear or central abnormalities, are going to affect gaze differently and can create gaze-evoked nystagmus. It's just a little different for a peripheral gaze of a nystagmus than what we see with central. We then have them do smooth pursuit tracking. So smooth pursuit is like watching a tennis game. You're trying to keep your eyes fixed on the ball as it goes back and forth, and we start out at a slow speed, but then increase that speed. We're looking for a breakdown in their ability to track a moving target. And that can tell us a great deal about the influence of central and peripheral problems. Saccades are where we're asking them to quickly follow randomly moving targets that appear and disappear out in front of them. We want to know, can the patient quickly shift their eyes accurately from dot to dot? What's the speed of their eye movement? How many milliseconds does it take for them to get to the target? In other words, what's their reaction time, the latency delay? And then also, do they overshoot the target, or do they, like a Parkinson's patient who's having trouble initiating motion, do they have to make little teeny tiny steps with their eyes to finally get to the target, or can they just accurately get there? With positionals, when the patient is without vision in the dark, is there any nystagmus 
present, that reflex beating of the eyes that should occur only when you're in motion but not occur if you're not? Is there any nystagmus present when the patient is supine, meaning laying on their back at a bit of an incline? When their head is turned to the right, to the left, and then with the chair laid flat down and then having them roll over onto their right side and then roll over onto the left. So positionals are just looking at what the eye, what kind of eye movements happen when they're in just static set positions. Is the nystagmus geotropic, meaning beating down toward the earth, or ageotropic, where it's beating away from the earth? Or is it vertical up beating or vertical down beating or oblique, meaning diagonal? Or is it torsional, that twisting movement? Different types or directions of eye movements will help us determine whether this is more likely central versus a peripheral disorder, although sometimes it's what we consider non-localized and we can't tell exactly where it's coming from. But hopefully the rest of our testing is really going to help nail that down. The Dick's Hall Pipe Maneuver is what we consider to be a positioning test where we're looking for positional vertigo. We'll get to that a little bit later. The caloric test is where we're artificially stimulating the horizontal balance canal. That's the canal that senses rightward and leftward head turns. And we do that in kind of an odd way. We're using hot and cold water, or some use hot and cold air. We'll do that if we have a perforated eardrum, a hole in the eardrum. But anyway, we're essentially using this to fool the inner ear into thinking we're turning our head when we aren't. Normally, both ears are going to get the same temperature change at the same time, like if you're diving into a cold lake or submerging into a hot tub, so this effect just normally cancels itself out. But it's when you get one ear hot or cold and not the other that creates the effect. So when I squirt cold water into the patient's right ear for 30 seconds, that cools the fluids of the horizontal balance canal and makes the fluids contract and move downward in the canal, which deflects the little hair cells of the cupula downward and makes the patient feel like they've just stepped onto a merry-go-round spinning to the left. That produces nystagmus, and we're then going to measure the speed or the velocity of that nystagmus to determine if one or both ears have normal function or if one or both might be impaired. So again, I apologize, I can't play my video clip for you. Um, I was just looking at caloric-induced nystagmus. Right-beating nystagmus is created um, by putting cold water into the left ear or also or when putting hot water into the right ear. Left-beating nystagmus is created by putting cold water in the right ear or when you put warm water into the left. Now, the Dix Hall Pike test, I'm really bummed out I can't show you the video on this, but anyway, positional vertigo is usually called, caused by calcium carbonate crystals that break off of the gravity sensors, which are, that's the utricle and saccule, and accidentally get up into the balance canals, usually the posterior canal. And the posterior canal is the one that senses movement through the pitch plane, which means laying down and sitting up primarily. So with the right hall pike maneuver, we take the patient from a sitting position, laying quickly down on their back with their head turned to the right at 45 degrees and then tilted downward at 30 degrees. If they have that debris in the right posterior canal, after about a five second delay, their eyes are gonna start twisting in a counterclockwise torsional nystagmus in the direction of their vertigo. If it's free-floating debris, the nystagmus usually only lasts about 20 seconds or so and then fades away, but it's usually a very intense vertigo at first. So think of it like shaking a snow globe. The nystagmus only lasts as long as it takes for that debris to trickle back down and sell down until I sit them back up, in which case then the debris is thrown the other way through the canal and they frequently get another wave of vertigo and a reversal of the nystagmus after sitting up. BPPV, that positional vertigo, is 
the most common cause of vertigo, but now fortunately, thanks to Dr. Epley and others with all the various canalithic repositioning maneuvers, it's usually the easiest to fix. But it can get really complicated sometimes if multiple canals are involved. Sometimes you have free floating particles. Sometimes you get sticky adhesive particles. So free floating particles create a condition we call canalithiasis, but the sticky adhesive particles create cupulolithiasis, meaning heavy cupula, which is a bit different in that the vertigo tends to go on for as long as you're in that position. So to treat that, we need to first knock those sticky particles off the cupula with some kind of a liberatory maneuver in order to clear them out. For some, liberatory maneuver just means whooping the patient upside the head. For others, it's a slightly more gentle approach. So computerized dynamic posturography. But first, here's my little soapbox. My college coach, Ron Jensen, reminded me that practice only makes perfect if you practice perfectly. Well-meaning coaches taught me how to do it wrong, and well-meaning mentors have done the same over the years. I'm still trying to unlearn some of these. We can hold fast and true to something for 30 years and still be completely wrong about it. So please read and reread your interpretation manuals. It was recently rewritten by Tom Boismer and Peggy Roller, and it's actually quite a good read. I learn or am reminded of something I'd forgotten every time I go through it. So please read and reread your interpretation manual. So posturography um, is made up basically of three different, three different portions. The sensory organization tests, we want to know how are they using vision to keep their balance? How are they using whatever inner ear balance information is available? And how are they using proprioception, their physical connection to the earth or somatosensory information? And I won't go through, you folks are pretty familiar with this. Um, so the motor control test, we're suddenly shifting the floor. And we're looking at reflexes that are primarily triggered by proprioceptive stimuli. So it might be perfectly normal in patients who have profound bilateral vestibular loss. Now, vestibular and visual inputs modulate but are not likely to initiate these responses in isolation. Now, this comes directly out of the interpretation manual. These reflexes, when the, the, the ankle joint has to suddenly stiffen in order to keep you from falling, they're mediated by long loop pathways involving the peripheral sensory and motor nerves, the ascending sensory, and descending, descending motor pathways of the spinal cord and the motor regions of the brainstem and cerebral cortex. Now in adaptation, instead of the floor shifting forward or backward, the floor is suddenly tilting. So we wanna know, are they able to suppress the long loop reflexes to very quickly relax the ankle joint and then show normal motor learning over repeated trials, meaning do they get more and more and more efficient or do they fall every time or do, are they very unstable? This is very important to know. Um, problems with this are going to put people at high risk for falls if they hit a, a sudden ramp they're not expecting or a sudden uh, drop in the pavement. So where posturography fits into the test battery? Our diagnostic tests are trying to determine what specifically caused the check engine light to come on. Posturography, the way I think of it, it takes it all for a test drive. It's a functional assessment, but it's also a behavioral assessment. Posturography assesses risk for falls. We need to try to prevent the fall before it happens. It helps provide specific goals for balance therapy. It helps determine rehabilitation potential. 
But we also need to keep in mind that musculoskeletal pain or other physical problems limiting the patient's mobility are going to affect the test results because it also affects their balance, their posture, their confidence, and their perceived limits of stability. Posturography also provides an invaluable insight into personality, into motivation, and oftentimes their emotional and psychiatric state. They may be calm, cool, collected, and very cooperative. Anxiety, panic disorder, and fear can go both ways. It can greatly increase their imbalance, or it might actually improve their balance in this certain test environment. So where the panic, the person panicking on there usually will do all sorts of maladaptive things. Um, they're they're going to have excessive um, hip strategy. Um, they, they might grab for the walls or step very quickly. They, they, um, they tend to just kind of freak out sometimes. But we also had a, a gal, she was about 90 years old, late 80s, maybe early 90s, and she came in um, just terrified that she, who was the primary caretaker for her elderly husband, who has Alzheimer's disease, she was scared to death that this test was going to tell her physician that she had to stop driving and lose her independence. So she came in on a walker with a very shuffling gait. Her feet were only moving maybe forward an inch or two with each step. And she was terrified but resolute when I got her onto that platform. She scored an almost perfect score. She was green bars all the way across. Because she was so stiff and so co-contracted, she never moved. Keep in mind, the support surface and the visual surround only move if you move. She scored almost perfectly, but is she at risk for fall? You better believe it. But keep in mind, this is an unusual result, but this is a behavioral test, not just a functional test. It tells you about the motivation of the patient. She was motivated by fear to not do poorly. Now, some patients are so sick and tired of going from physician to physician to the physician Recent research shows that the average pace, patient with a um, dizziness or balance disorder spends five years before they're seen by an appropriate physician. So they might be trying to help show their disorder to try to get a diagnosis. Then we also have conversion disorder. So conversion disorder is a psychiatric problem. They, um, we frequently seen it in, have seen it in uh, young teenage girls who are subconsciously trying to avoid school or maybe a stressful situation at home who suddenly become incapacitatingly dizzy or suddenly can't walk. So again, this is a psychiatric disorder. We also see secondary gain. We see a lot of workers' compensation patients, so injured workers who are specific specifically sent in to see us for posturography because it's so sensitive to embellishment. And the Mallinson criteria, Goebel, really helps to objectify the findings um, so that we can determine what the probability of an aphysiologic, an aphysiologic performance is. So we're looking for circular sway patterns, excessive lateral sway um, 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 strategy. Um, we're, we're looking for excessive startles, just all sorts of things. So it's very helpful to take the clinician out of it and help objectify the performance. So here we have our nice, calm, cool, collected and cooperative patient. But we also have a few others who come into our clinic. We see those with anxiety and panic disorders. Yes, here's secondary gain and conversion disorders. 
just a little over the top. Every patient is unique. There's no two alike, even those with exactly the same disorder. Personalities will always come through, and they will affect your test results. How many of you have actually tested the surfer dude? I'm telling you, you'll see people who actually do that on posturography. And I've seen the hulks. And I've seen the great men. And I've also seen the resilient yet humble Eskimo. Patients come in all shapes and sizes. Whoa, chewy. People also are of different nationalities and cultures, and all these factors are going to play a role in how they take this test. So here's my special nod, nod to NASA. NASA, you have been huge and done amazing things for advancing my field. Thank you. So besides posturography itself and the other testing, we need to learn how to effectively communicate our test results. You have to know your audience. There's a huge push in our hospital and other hospitals across the country to start using living room language to explain tests and test results to our patients and to familiar uh, pr professionals that are unfamiliar with the audiology and vestibular testing. So eliminate the jargon or at least explain it. Explain the relevance of the data and make appropriate re recommendations, but know your audience and adapt. I might, I might write my reports differently depending on which physician or nurse practitioner or physician's assistant, chiropractor, whoever sent the patient to me. Some physicians are going to want my thoughts and recommendations. Some do not. They just want the data. So know your audience and adapt. The rule of thumb with patients is to speak and write at a sixth grade level, not demeaning at all, just minus all the highfalutin terms we, we learn in school and use living room language. It's all about communicating the information. Speaking over their head belittles them, and it actually makes us look bad, and it should. But what does it mean? Her center of gravity is displaced posteriorly, and she's using an ankle-dominant strategy. Okay, well, what does that mean? Her tendency to bear weight back on her heels and her over-reliance on ankle strategy puts her at extremely high risk for dangerous backward free falls and serious head injury, vestibular, rehabilita <laughs> vestibular rehabilitation therapy and falls prevention is strongly recommended. Or I might say on a different patient, her excessive use of hip strategy is further destabilizing and greatly increases her risk for falls on slippery surfaces such as wet floors or icy drivewalks, or driveways and sidewalks. So a vestibular dysfunction pattern, this is when they fall on conditions five and six. So condition five is eyes closed on an unstable surface. Condition six is eyes open, but with the visual surround and floor unstable, both of these things force you to rely on vestibular information primarily to prevent a fall. So does the patient actually have a measurable peripheral loss peripheral loss of function, or is she just not able to effectively use vestibular information for balance and postural control? Both might have um, that 5-6 pattern, but what I might write is that um, this patient will be at high risk for falls on uneven soft surfaces or when they're in low light conditions or complex visual environments. So they'll be at high risk for falls on a rocky or sandy beach, watching waves roll in or looking up and, and watching the seagulls or kites fly by, or um, maybe on an uneven sidewalk when they're watching traffic go by, 
Or what about the gal going out to change the hummingbird feeders at night walking on soft grass or gravel? Another thing is that it's very important to get to know your vestibular physical therapist. So invite them over to observe testing and you observe them. On a regular basis, discuss interesting or perplexing patients and figure it out together. And then we have different code words or code phrases that we'll use with the therapist. Like the one I use when I think the dizziness and imbalance is primarily anxiety driven and not an inner ear balance disorder is to, quote, help improve balance confidence. Falls. According to the National Institutes of Health, falls are the number one cause of accidental death in people 65 years and older, and many of these are preventable. Just in the year 2000, there were 10,300 fatal falls and 2.6 million non-fatal falls reported in the United States. Fall-related direct medical costs are estimated at $6.8 million per year. And that's only direct medical costs. Indirect costs can go far above that. And especially with all the baby boomers coming along, this number, all these numbers are only going to increase. So I have a new sense of urgency about falls. On June 1st, my 80-year-old mother, who is a very fit woman, and used to going for her daily walk, had a very serious lapse in judgment that resulted in a bad fall down a steep hill where she was going quite encumbered with a heavy load. She fractured her pelvis. I got the call. Then I'm in the ambulance with her and exchanging a bazillion texts and calls between family members, her assisted living staff and physician. She's confused and in pain. And we get to the emergency room of some other area hospital, and their emergency room is just, it seems like it's in total dysfunction and disarray. And they're all using this conf confusing jargon that I can barely understand, much less my mother. Then I'm dealing with insurances, trying to coordinate 24-7 in-home aids, arranging for physical therapists and nursing visits, yada, yada. One thing I will tell you if you or a loved one ever goes to the hospital with a serious medical condition, contact the social worker discharge planner immediately to get them on your team and help you navigate the system. They are hugely helpful. By the way, she's now getting around pretty well on a walker and doing much better. So in conclusion, as audiologists, our job and our passion is to provide excellent and accurate data and observations and to effectively communicate our findings to facilitate any appropriate medical and surgical treatment and to provide that information that's necessary to help the therapist deliver the most individualized and the most successful rehabilitation and falls prevention therapy possible and try to prevent the fall before it happens. Now, just as a closing illustration, I want to go back to the importance of diagnostic testing for just a moment. I didn't mean to be eavesdropping, but I was in Elmer's having breakfast a few months ago, and I overheard a person talking about her sister who's had vertigo now for three months. She's miserable. She's missing work. She's exhausted her sick and vacation time, and nobody in her small town knows what's going on or what's wrong with her. Nobody can help her. And I'm listening to the sister go on and on and on about how this woman's life is destroyed, both physically and financially. So I finally went over and said, I didn't mean to be eavesdropping, but I just can't help it. I'm Sue Doucette. I work at Legacy Good Samaritan Hospital in Portland. And what I do for a living is to help people with dizziness and balance disorders. Have your sister give me a call. Here's my card. So her sister called and we arranged for her to come in. She'd been receiving physical therapy in her small town for a couple of months, but not making any progress. Every time she turns her head, the whole world swims and gets blurry, and it just makes her intensely ill. No diagnostic testing had been done. 
The therapists were treating her as if she had had a vestibular neuritis, a sudden loss of function on one side, but she wasn't getting any better. So I did the testing. Well, she had no response whatsoever to caloric testing. So a bilateral loss. Not only that, she had a complete bilateral loss by rotary chair. There was nothing left even up in the highest frequencies, which is really unusual. She had nothing left. They could have done standard vestibular rehab forever and never been able to appropriately help this woman. Now that we know that it's total bilateral, excuse me, my phone's ringing there. Let me get rid of that. have done standard rehab forever and not been able to appropriately help this woman. But now that we know that it's a total bilateral loss, that's a game changer. We can teach her to move her eyes before she turns her head or do other substitutionary things, and she's already doing much better. But this just shows how diagnostic testing is critical. So now I just want to give a special shout out to my doctoral students, Adrian and Nadia. Thanks, gals. And a very special thank you to my brother, Ben Doucette, and my niece, Katie, for all the excellent Photoshop fun that you did for me. And thank you all for joining me here, and thank you again, Teresa. Dr. Doucette, thank you for an excellent and very thorough and informative presentation. We truly appreciate the time you took to put this presentation together and to present it for us today, so thank you very much. For our attendees, we'd like to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule for attending today's presentation. This will conclude the recording of our e-seminar. Have a fantastic day.